like sand through the hourglass. These are the days of our Lahayam. Now, way back in season one, which I preached a couple months ago, for those of you who are here, we delved into the ancient stories that shape the destinies of generations. Sarah's longing for a child with Abraham laid, led her to a fateful decision. She bestowed her slave girl, Hagar, upon Abraham to bear a son. Ultimately, Sarah got jealous and Hagar and Ishmael were banished. Abraham and Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Isaac marries Rebekah and they give birth to twins, Esau and Jacob. Jacob is a trickster and steals his brother's birthright blessing. Jacob, a man who's torn between two sisters, found himself ensnared in a love triangle, marrying Leah and then her sister Rachel also. He unknowingly set the stage for a saga of love, jealousy, and rivalry. Rachel couldn't bear children, so just like her grandmother-in-law, she orders Bilhah, her slave, to give her children with Jacob. Meanwhile, Leah, not to be outdone by her sister, also gives her slave, Zilpah, to Jacob. Here is the biblical marriage of Jacob. One man, one woman, another woman who happens to be her sister, and their womb slaves. Leah gives birth to Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishar, Zebulun, and a daughter, Zina. Bilhah, Rachel's slave, gives birth to Dan and Naphtali. Zilpah, Leah's slave, gives birth to Gad and Asher. And Rachel eventually does bear children, gives birth to Joseph, the topic of our scripture today, and later Benjamin. Now this week on Days of Rahayim, jealousy and desperation catches up with them. All the children are playing out the sins of their parents. Joseph is the favorite son of Jacob, born from his favorite wife, Rachel. The text says that he loved Joseph more than any other. He presents him with a coat of many colors, or more accurately translated as a long flowing gown. The only other places in the Bible this type of gown is used is to describe the dress that a princess would wear. Joseph doesn't fit the norm. You might say he's a bit queer. He is also privileged, though. He's entitled. He gets all the best stuff. And while his brothers, born from Zilpah and Bilhah, had to do the hard work of, of laboring and herding sheep, Joseph's job was to go out and spy on his brothers and report back to his dad. He was a privileged snitch wearing a queer dress. Zilpah's and Bilhah's sons, born of second wives, treated as second children, would play out the toxic environment they were born into. Their own father taught them through his actions with his brother Esau, you don't like your place in life, you do whatever it takes to move up. And so Jacob is thrown into a pit, which is where we get the lesser known biblical phrase, snitches get ditches. In a twist of fate, Jacob's favorite son is sold into slavery by the sons of the slave women he took as his own. And not only that, Joseph is sold to the descendants of Jacob's grandmother's womb slave, Hagar, the Ishmaelites. This toxic karma of this family that's as riddled as the royal family has come full circle. The neglected children of Hagar discovered a common interest with the neglected children of Bilhah and Zilpah. Now, I've preached this story at Allendale before. Last time, it was about three years ago, I focused on Joseph in that princess dress of many colors, the dreamer sold into slavery, and the searing knowledge that his own brothers had betrayed him. That, that's a perfectly fine sermon. In fact, one of my go-to theologians, womanist scholar, Dr. Will Gaffney, is, is preaching that very sermon right now over in Texas. The title of her sermon is, quote, Saving Joseph and All the Other Queer Kids. 
She says, for all of you who need more than Jesus saves on a t-shirt when your journey is taking you to places you don't wanna go and subjecting you to trauma that you did not choose, this sermon is for you. Now that's a great sermon and you should go and watch it. We'll post her sermon later, but that's not our sermon here today. Theologian Casey Overton, pronouns she, they, wrote an amazing commentary on this story that haunted me over and over again this week. And as much as I I wanted to to preach away from it or, or choose a different lens, Bilhah and Zilpah, the two women at the very beginning of this text, kept calling to me. You see, before we even get to Joseph's interactions with Jacob or his brothers, verse two sets us up with a very intentional detail that distinguishes itself from the others. Quote, he would accompany the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. Women? The sentence names the women to explain who the men are. This is very unusual in the Bible. The author needs us to know that these brothers aren't Rachel and Leah's birth children. The author needs us to pay attention to these mothers. Bilhah and Zilpah, mere slave women whose bodies were used to produce a full third of the 12 tribes of Israel. Womanist scholar, Dr. Will Gaffney, who I mentioned earlier, translates Genesis chapter 30, verse three to say, quote, Rachel said, look, my womb slave, Bilhah, come in her and she will give birth on my knees that I may also build babies through her. Bilhah and Zilpah, often overlooked in prayers naming the matriarchs in Judaism and in Christianity. They are combined as a footnote to Israel's story. Some translations describe them simply as maidservants, but that intentionally obscures the sexual nature of their specific servitude. In some cases, Dr. Gaffney translates their description as womb slave. In these cases, the girls are given by other women to men for sex for the express purpose of impregnating them. She argues that it is more appropriate to describe the womb slaves as girls rather than women because they are likely young enough to be presumed fertile and virgins in order that the paternity of their children may not be disputed. Bilhah is first enslaved to Laban, father of Leah and Rachel, before being passed on to his daughter, Rachel. Bilhah and Zilpah's sexual subordination evokes the sexual abuse of enslaved Africans in the United States and the Caribbean and other places. Dr. Gaffney writes that unlike the white women who benefited, benefited from slavery in the Atlantic, Rachel and Leah do not pretend not to know about the sexual contact between their men and their slaves. And when Rachel gives Bilhah to Jacob, and Leah gives, gives her slave to Jacob. They give them as wives, yet they remain enslaved. Rachel and Leah, like other women who use their slaves as childbearing surrogates, claim the children as their own. Bilhah's body is used again in Genesis chapter 35. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn son, rapes her. The pain, the anguish, the rage and shame that Bilhah must have felt are and sadly are not difficult to imagine for us. No comfort is offered to Bilhah in the text. Was she supported by other slave women, by Zilpah who shared her lot in life? Bilhah may be the woman with the most sexual partners in the scripture of which she did not choose. Yet something of Bilhah endures and transcends the abuse heaped on her body because in 1 Chronicles chapter four, there is a town named Bilhah that's settled by the descendants of Simeon. Dr. Gaffney writes that Bilhah and Zilpah represent the women who have had more than one abusive relationship. 
the women who have been raped by more than one perpetrator, the women who have been betrayed by women and men who have never known anyone to value them for more than what they think about their body. And Bilhah and Zilpah represent the women who survive their abuse. Often in scripture and in liturgical prayers, we see God of our fathers, God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Dr. Gaffney calls us to always add Hagar and Sarah, Leah, Rachel, Bilhah and Zilpah. Because Bilhah and Zilpah are the mothers of Israel and after all that they have been through, after all that was done to them to erase their name from the chronicle of their descendants and their people, to not name them is to do further violence to them. The legacy of controlling women's bodies established in these ancient narratives finds parallels in present day conservative Christian values. The manipulation and subjugation of women's reproductive rights, often justified under the guise of religious doctrine, is a continuation of the harm that that started centuries ago. These values perpetrate gender inequality, restricting women's agency and autonomy. The stories of Hagar and Bilhah and Zilpah, who are second wife womb slaves, and the stories of Sarah, Rachel, and Leah, Wives who were given to marriage only by the consent of their fathers. All of these women and their children reveal a distressing legacy of hurt people hurting others. The control of women's bodies woven into the fabric of history cast a long shadow that continues to shape our present day. Viewing these stories through a womanist perspective, that is a a black feminist lens inspired by theologians like Dr. Will Gaffney. It unveils a deeply rooted power dynamic and systemic control that have persisted across time. Breaking free from this cycle demands a re-examination of religious interpretations and even the preaching of this very text. Harmful ideologies that perpetrate the subjugation of women. Only then can we truly truly honor the legacy of those women by creating a world where hurt people no longer perpetrate harm. Maybe the answer lies in listening to and believing women. In today's story, the voice of the women who were silenced by the author of Genesis. What if we listen to them? So here now, if you will, and imagine Midrash by Zilpah, and Bilpa. Our voices remain veiled. Our pain concealed behind the tapestries of power and the shadows of those who controlled us. We are Zilpa and Bilha, silent witnesses to a narrative that only grazes the surface of our existence, relegating us to the sidelines of a story not truly our own. We speak now across time of the pain we secretly felt, but were never allowed to express. We felt bad for young Joseph in the pit. No one should know the pain of being sold into slavery, especially by their own kind. If anyone knows that pain, we do. We more than most know what it is like to live life thrown into a proverbial pit. In the darkness, the walls seem to close in around you. You find yourself in a place that you never wanted to be. It's not just the physical isolation that weighs you down. It's the searing knowledge that your own people put you there. Like Joseph, even in our pits of despair, we know we have a choice either to succumb allowing the sins of others to decide our fate, or we could rise above, crafting our own path out of the depths. Like Joseph, we too had dreams, visions that once burned brightly within us. The fragments that remain remind us this trauma we have not chosen can be transformed into a source of strength. From the moment we entered this world, our lives were not our own. Our bodies were claimed by others. We were treated as mere vessels to carry the legacies of those who held power over us. Our identities were reduced to our roles, given names that bound us to this servitude. 
Our bodies, our beings were exploited and abused. We were consigned to fulfill the desires of our mistresses, to bear the burden of their barrenness. We felt the weight of their longing, their desperation for children who would secure their positions and their worth. And so we surrendered to the fate that was thrust upon us, bound by chains of duty and submission. In your scriptures, our stories are mere whispers. Hence, between the lines, the pain of labor, the tears that we shed in solitude, the aching emptiness that followed the relinquishing of our children to our mistresses. These are the threads of our existence that were never fully woven into the tapestry of your Bible. Our suffering remains hidden, our stories unfinished. We watch in silent agony as our sons, pawns in a twisted game of power, shattered our own hearts the day they chose to throw Joseph into that pit and sell him into slavery. Would we be remembered as matriarchs, as mothers who suffered silently for the sake of others? Or would our stories be confined to the margins, overshadowed by the narratives of Leah and Rachel? As time stretched forward, we wondered how the generations to come would perceive us as mere footnotes or as resilient spirits. And as for the future, we dared to wonder aloud, how long would this cycle of controlling women's bodies persist? How many more generations would be ensnared by the same chains of power and subjugation? Would our pain be repeated would your voices be stifled too? Would your stories also be relegated to whispers? But in our pain, we find our solidarity with countless others who have been silenced throughout history. We know that the struggle for autonomy, for agency over our bodies and our, our destinies will endure. The echoes of our stories, our unspoken sorrows reverberate, urging us all to break free from the cycle that has bound us for too long. We wonder how long it will take for the chains that bound us to finally shatter. How many more generations must endure the weight of societal expectations and religious interpretations that restrict us from our beloved autonomy? Our stories resonate in the hearts of those who seek justice, equality, and freedom. We know for we see our story today resonating with you all. Reproductive justice, a dream that still eludes us fully, is a beacon of hope. It is a vision where women reclaim their bodies, where choices are made with dignity, a future where the legacy of controlling women's bodies is finally cast aside, where the lessons of the past are learned and embraced. The mistakes of the past have a stubborn way of persisting. Your Supreme Court and state legislature have proved that. Yet in our whispers and the strength of those who continue to fight, there is a glimmer of hope. We see seeds being planted, voices growing louder as people of all generations rally together for a world where decisions about wombs and lives are determined by those who inhabit them. We see the potential for a transformation that breaks this cycle. It's a transformation that calls for education and empathy and a willingness to challenge the status quo. You see, reproductive justice isn't just about the present, but also generations to come. It's about ensuring that the mistakes of the past are not repeated and that the pain we endured will not be in vain. Reproductive justice is not a decision between pro-life and pro-choice as, as some of your generation frame it, our autonomy over our bodies, our consent, choosing if and with whom we bring children to this world with, that is choosing life. Or are our lives not deemed important enough? Our whispers become a chorus, a reminder that the power to rewrite the narrative lies within us all, a reminder that the trauma that pushed us into that proverbial pit was not the end of humanity's story. And so in your pit of uncertainty where you find yourselves today, know and hold fast to our collective dreams and determination for it is only a chapter, a stepping stone 
toward our own redemption. People say that Joseph was a dreamer. But we know he's not the only one. So join us so we can be as one. God the Creator, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.